I'm your host, Darren Heath. I'd like to take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 42 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. And on that note, let me say that this is a very special episode of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Originally, I was going to release it as a special edition, but you know what? This is important enough that I don't want it to get lost in the clutter for people that are not looking for special edition episodes, and it's going to be a standard release. However, there will be a special edition release of the audio for the interview portion of this show. Now, if you want to find the show notes for this episode, go to gunrightsintexas.com slash 042. Now that we have that out of the way, it's time to go on to our gun of the show. Now, it's not very often that I bring up Glocks in general because, well, I don't own that many of them. I own two. Now, this being episode 42, it would be fitting to bring up the Glock 42 as the gun of the show, but I already used it as the gun of the show. Well, since this spot rightfully belongs to Glock, we're going to give it to them anyway. However, we're going to talk about the Glock 20 SF. Now, I stumbled into the opportunity to purchase this gun at a good price, and I wanted a 10 millimeter for hog hunting for a while. However, I wasn't going to go out of my way to get one. Now, with that said, I would have ordered a 1911 chambered in 10 millimeter, but in all honesty, the Glock is the most effective 10 millimeter on the market for the money. Now, for those who don't know, introduced in 1991 and intended for law enforcement and military markets, the 10 millimeter Glock 20 is capable of handling the full power and reduced power FBI loads. Due to the 10 millimeter cartridge having performance between that of a 357 and 41 Magnum, it has excelled in the handgun hunting niche. Known for its extreme performance, flat shooting, and above average effectiveness, the 10mm along with the Glock 20 are an effective combination. Now, I'm going to give you a few specs on this before we move on because this is going to be a longer than normal episode. The specs on the Glock 20, it's, well, let me go on and say this is the, this particular model is the Glock 20 SF. It's chambered in 10mm, has a capacity of 15 plus 1, it's a double action only handgun, The sights, well, they're the standard Glock sights, and they are drift adjustable if you don't drift them too hard because, well, they're polymer and they'll break. The materials in the gun are polymer for the frame, and the slide is made out of steel. It weighs in at 30.71 ounces and has an MSRP of $637. Mine is a Gen 3. I could have had a Gen 4, but I really didn't want the Gen 4. I had some bad experiences with those, and if you want to hear my Gen 4 bad experiences... Tune in to the Pro Gun Podcast and go back through the back catalog there. With that said, I want to run the audio that'll let you know how to find the show, and then I'll get on to listener feedback. The Gun Rights in Texas Podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, and in the Microsoft Windows Podcast Store. Of course, you can always download the show see the show notes as well as comment by going to the website gunrightsintexas.com Our first listener feedback comes from Bill Davis who wrote in with I am a lifelong gun owner and Texan but new to competitive shooting and was wondering if you could or would discuss it in the future. Well, I am personally uh, one of those that do not do competitive shooting. However, I may be able to arrange to get someone to come on the show and discuss it. For those who don't know, I, I have a psychological block with competitive shooting. It's not that there's anything wrong with competitive shooting. It's that it's something that was ingrained to me when I was little around firearms, and I have a hard time getting past it. I just cannot do competitive shooting because of it. Now then, we have another episode where Nate V. Oliver wrote in with great podcast. I like this better than open carry. I guess he meant he likes it better than the open carry report. And I feel we need more state-oriented podcast. I actually met you when you were at the McKamey Jeep Fest in 2013 and wanted to say I'm sad to hear that the mountain goat of yours was wrecked. I hope you get it fixed and back on the road. Well, thanks for the kind words, Nate. Uh, You wouldn't be the one who started calling it the mountain goat, would you? Now, to clue in listeners, uh, back in 2013, I took a stock 06 Unlimited Jeep Wrangler Rubicon model on the trail that stock vehicles were recommended to avoid. This was no intention on my part. I had actually intended to go on the trail that was recommended for the stock vehicles, but me and my passenger, who was a far more experienced Jeeper than I was, never saw the other vehicles turn off to go that direction. It may be because the crowd we were rolling with 
were pretty much all modified vehicles and didn't have a second thought about taking the, uh, the trail that was recommended against stock vehicles taking. Now, not only did I take it on that trail, I took it on that trail with passenger car tires. Now, to the surprise of nearly everyone, myself included, I not only pulled it off, but I only got winched up in one situation, and that was because I got into very deep sand and sucked in, and it sunk down until I encountered a rather large rock that high centered me. Now, after I climbed the hill, and nearly everyone, nearly everyone had trouble getting up that hill. Most of the vehicles did have to get winched up. I think there were two or three that didn't. However, after I got to the top of that hill and through all that sand, nearly everyone up there. Uh, was standing around enjoying the view and one of the guys approached me and this may be Nate that did it however one of the guys approached me and informed me my old J Ruby wasn't a jeep it was a mountain goat now the rest of the time I was there I heard people call it that white mountain goat but uh just for the record I had no intention of getting that vehicle into that situation I really did plan to take the uh, path that was intended for the stock vehicles for those that don't know, I did roll my Jeep, uh, well, two weeks two weeks ago when this is released to the general public, I will have rolled my Jeep. But the vehicle is in remarkably good shape for everything it went through. I have driven it since then. In fact, I'm going to go do a little bit of driving with it today. I got to drive it to the car wash and wash the interior out and wash, the, wash all the dirt where it rolled off so that way next week when I can hopefully get it into the body shop they can get the repairs done and we'll be finished hey you can't go wrong with that but yeah the damage is relatively minor when you consider what the vehicle went through and I did upgrade the tires they're no longer passenger car tires with that said I'm going to in the listener feedback at that point I did get more but nobody really told me that they were willing to let me use it so I'm not going to use theirs, and I'm going to go ahead and let people know how to find the show on social media. And I really do need to update the social media and how to get the show, because this show is available on YouTube as well. And what I need to include in the uh, social media now is that you can get the gun of the show a day or two in advance of the podcast being released in most cases by going to our Instagram page. And there's a link to our Instagram page at the top of the website. And hopefully I'll get that into the social media audio as well. But let's go ahead and play that so we can get on to our interview. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on social media. Links to all the social media profiles can be found on the website. On Twitter, the podcast is at Gun Rights in TX. On Facebook and Google Plus, it is Gun Rights in Texas. So please be social. We have a guest for this episode, and I'd like to take a moment and welcome Charles Cotton to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. For those who don't know, Charles is an extremely active member in, or extremely active in Texas politics, a member of the NRA Board of Directors. He leads the Texas Firearms Coalition, and he is an attorney. Now, with that said, I believe there is a disclaimer that Charles would probably want to get out of the way. So, Charles, if you would, be so kind as to tell us a little bit about yourself and go ahead and make that disclaimer, and I'll quit talking for a moment to let you do that. That's funny. You know, a lawyer is always going to have a disclaimer. I don't care if it's an advertisement or, or on the back of our business cards. But no, I, seriously, I appreciate that. Um, as you said, I've I've been heavily involved in, in Texas politics, oh, I guess going all the way back to 1980 when I wrote a bill that uh, was intended to be filed in the 81 legislative session that would have established a concealed handgun statute in Texas. But the murder of John Lennon in December of 1980 kicked off such a furor of anti-handgun sentiment around the country that uh, an old school buddy of mine, Ralph Wallace, who was uh, then in the in the Texas House, uh, said, sorry, but there's no reason to even file it with, with the current uh, political climate. So I've been involved ever since then. Uh, and I won't, I won't give you the long version, but I have been uh, writing and reviewing and analyzing legislation, oh, so I guess since 87. And I've written some or all of, of most of the 
bills that uh, that we have passed in that in that period of time. Uh, as you said, I'm I'm on the NRA board of directors. I was elected in 2001 and still serve on the board. And and the uh, disclaimer that that you knew was coming is that I need need to make it clear that when we're talking today, I'm giving you the my personal opinions and the and the position of the Texas Firearms Coalition, not the NRA. Uh, just like any corporate board of directors, the only time we can speak on behalf of the NRA is when we are gathered together as a body and are actually speaking as the NRA Board of Directors. Okay, that sounds good. Now, uh, recently, the 84th Legislature met in Austin. We're talking on Friday, and they met on Tuesday. Now, that means that Open Carry, Tarrant County, Katy, Lone Star Gun Rights, and a few others had some opportunities to do damage that very first day of the legislature, legislature meeting. Sorry about that. I'm tongue-tied. Now, there were two issues that happened on the opening day. The first was... Uh, the press ran with it all the way leading up to it where open carry advocates brought in one of the ghost gunner milling machines to manufacture an AR-15 lower receiver on the Capitol steps. But that one's pretty much been forgotten about because of the second incident, and that happened in uh, the office of State Representative Pancho Navarez. Now, on that one, yeah. uh, let me ask you, uh, I just for clarification, I started trying to get with you to do this episode before that happened and that's almost exactly what i was kind of wanting to bring into the discussion was how to behave when you're dealing with the representative so charles if you don't mind what were your thoughts when you first learned of that particular incident well you know i could i could try to downplay it and be politically correct but an honest answer is i was shocked i, I was completely shocked that anyone would engage in that type of conduct trying to pass a bill um as you as you noted the the ghost gunner i believe is the name of that machine that'll that will mill um 80% ar lowers when that came out that they were going to be make, basically making lower receivers on the courthouse i mean on the um, the capitol steps <coughs> i thought to myself why why in the world would you do that number one that is pretty provocative with the media now most people aren't going to be upset about it that's that's what i think a lot of uh activists don't realize is that certainly their rank and file members are not going to be upset. Uh, most people who walk by look at that and say, oh, hey, what's that? Yeah, there are going to be some that, that are upset about it. But the media is going to have a field day with it. And and frankly, uh, I was at NRA all last week in, in committee meetings and then ultimately uh, one of our three mandatory uh, board meetings every year. And one of the things that I reviewed was the new BATFE regulations about finishing uh, incomplete receivers and how you cannot lend machinery to anyone else. So I thought, well, that was a rather timely thing to say. But but those are minor compared to what happened in Representative Navarro's office. I mean, to go in and and be so demanding, so antagonistic, so insulting, and then to whip out a cell phone or whatever they had to video that, uh, it's it's just it's to me as as a political activist for thirty five years, I can't comprehend how anyone could possibly think that was helpful. Now I realize that at times it's hard it's hard for some folks to understand that the political process has been described as moving at the, at a glacial pace, and it is slower than most of us would, would ever want, including those of us who have been in the trenches for, for decades. But to let your zeal come out in that fashion in such a destructive, counterproductive way, uh, to me, was surprising. Uh, obviously, they represent a very small number of, of gun owners that would that would engage in that kind of conduct, and hopefully that uh, hopefully it won't have a direct impact or much of an impact on licensed open carry, but I would not be at all surprised to to learn later in the session that that event alone killed even the small chance that existed of passing unlicensed open carry or what some folks refer to as constitutional carry. You absolutely must be a statesman when you're trying to promote any kind of legislation or win anyone to your side of an issue. Uh, in all my years, both as, you know, living on this earth and certainly the 35 years of being a political activist, 
I have never once seen anyone frightened, intimidated, or insulted into voting your way. It always works the other way. I understand that. Uh, you know, you were talking about how you know this pretty much killed the small chance that unlicensed carry had, and beyond that, generally speaking, what kind of damage can we expect to see out of this besides what it did to the unlicensed carry? That's yet to be seen, but if if I were forced to. If I were running uh, a particular campaign or something and and the candidate asked me, uh, where do we go from here on this one? Do you think it's dead? Uh, my opinion would say you probably have put uh, licensed open carry on life support, if not killed it outright. Um, it's interesting that we had had a problem, um, well, for several months uh, with with the open carry of rifles and shotguns, uh, demonstrations with rifles and shotguns especially those where people walked into stores and restaurants, and the media had a field day with it. And it seemed like it was just incessant. Uh, The more media time they got, the more they did it, even though the uh, overwhelming coverage was negative. Well, that went on, and as recently as, as summer of this year, the chances of passing any open carry uh, w- was very slim. Uh, <laughs> constituents were calling uh, staffers. A lot of legislators, most legislators, were not in Austin during the, during the summer, but their staff does stay there, and they were getting calls. And it was just resoundingly against open carry, and you, know, you have to do something about quote unquote those people and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> well, then. For reasons that I won't get into, and frankly, some of it is unknown to me of why, but we had a period of about six months of relative quiet. We didn't have the we didn't have people carrying long guns into restaurants or stores. There were some demonstrations on the street, but they seemed to be conducted uh, more responsibly with prior notice to law enforcement. So it didn't give the media, you know, the the kind of the blood in the streets portrayal that they so desperately want. And things were looking very good. Um, there, that that six-month period of quiet uh, led a lot of legislators who were going to support uh, open carry based on work that the NRA and TSRA had done since 2013 session. And things were looking very good. You, you can never say that something's in the back, but it looked very good. Uh, all of that may have been destroyed in a single incident on a single day and Representative Navarro's office. And it's truly unfortunate, you know, that one small group of people can do so much damage to so much work put forward by those like yourself, Alice Tripp, and Tara Micah. The, uh, I mean, in my opinion, these people, you know, I don't think they're enemy plants, but I think the enemy is glad that they're on our side. I, I agree with that opinion. I know some people uh, think that the the tactics, and not only open carry Tarrant County, which is what we're talking about here in in, in the incident two days ago, uh, there are a number of gun owners, uh, a number of gun owners who support and want to see open carry pass, that believe that these folks are plants, that they are some some kind of you know fifth column in the pro gun movement. I won't go that far. I don't think that's the case. I think it's. I think it's a combination of two things. I think, number one, the organizations got started, and and to my knowledge, they exist only on Facebook pages and and email lists. But I may be wrong there, and it really doesn't matter. But I think what happened was they, they became a voice for a single issue, and that was open carry or is open carry. And that they got a lot of quote unquote likes on a Facebook page or on their enclosed groups on Facebook where you can join quote unquote. I think they got a lot of folks in there uh, initially because they supported the issue and they wanted to support an organization that whose focal point was solely that one issue. Over time, though, the tactics became more and more radical, more and more confrontational, and they were causing increasingly more damage to the issue itself. And unfortunately, for people who don't have experience in how to pass legislation, the natural reaction to being rejected can often be turning up the volume, which is precisely the opposite of what needs to be done. Uh, I don't care if you're fighting a campaign for a candidate, if you're fighting a legislative battle over a bill or a concept, or if you're fighting a battle, a shooting war in the desert, 
when you find out something doesn't work, you don't continue doing the same thing. You back off, decide you know, what went wrong here. How can I better accomplish the goal? And I don't see that. I don't see that. And I think it's largely because of inexperience. L- let me say it this way. I think I think the result that we're seeing is a combination of inexperience and being overly zealous. I think that's what's caused the problem. The question is, how much damage has been caused? Will they back off at this point? I, I will say this with, with a great deal of confidence. If we continue to see open carry demonstrations while this, well, I say this, there's actually six open carry bills filed now, and I have it on good good information that there will be more, be more <laughs> filed. Um, if we see continued demonstrations now, they can only hurt the cause. Right now, we need to return to that six months of quiet and uh, give folks who know what they're doing the opportunity to get this done. I'm not saying it can be done anymore. It may be that you know the uh, open carry patient is terminal, for, at least for this session. I, I just don't know. Well, um, I, I do have to say that in some ways I'm kind of glad that they had the attacks on the NRA and the TSRA coming from the open carry camp because now anybody that anybody that can – they, they're nobody, not even the media, is saying, "Hey, this is the NRA's that, uh, people that did this." Everybody already knows that these people are not part of the NRA or the TSRA, thanks to those attacks. And I never thought I would say it, but I'm glad they did those attacks. Now, you know, it, it, it's very much the uh, "somebody gave you lemons, make lemonade" situation, and and I've got to admit, I'm not happy that they did what they did because. Again, you can't ever say that any given bill is in the bag. At least the only time in my involvement in in, in gun legislation and gun politics that has been true was the day that uh, George Bush was elected governor, because it was real plain from from day one during the campaigns that he would sign an open uh, a concealed carry bill, and he did so in '95. Other than that, you can never say anything's in the bag. But this almost was. So I'm not happy they did what they did, but since it did happen, I am I am thrilled that it's clear to the public, and now it's clear to to our elected officials in Austin that neither the NRA nor the TSRA had anything to do with those tactics, those demonstrations, because one of the first questions that were coming from staffers and even some calls from elected officials when the the um, carrying of rifles and shotguns into stores and restaurants started hitting the, the airways. The first question that, that our representatives were asked were, is that your folks? And the resounding answer was, no, absolutely not. The follow-up question was, can you stop it? And the answer was, sorry, we can't. So you're right. Uh, it is. If there is anything good out of this, if, the, if we can make any lemonade out of this, this basket of lemons, it's the fact that those who who the NRA and TSRA have influence with, understand we were not behind this, we don't condone it, and I think we have all done a very good job of of showing at least the folks in Austin and probably most of the general public that the acts of these people are not representative of the conduct they can expect from law-abiding, responsible Texas gun owners. Uh, the analogy I try to draw is we have millions of Texas drivers on the road every day, and you cannot look at the one drunk driver that causes a fatal accident and say that's representative of all drivers. And I agree with that entirely. And, uh, you know, originally I was I had, e- or not emailed you, but I'd messaged you on uh, the Texas CHL forum that you run about getting you on to talk about an article you wrote the, uh, on the Texas Firearms Coalition website. Uh, the, the article's titled, What's Up With Open Carry Now? And you closed it with the line, If you want to see open carry pass, then continue to approach the issue in a statesmanlike manner and be ready to answer calls to action when they are issued. Now, coming off of that, I would like to ask you, how should these folks have approached this situation? And what is a statesmanlike manner as well as how can people best approach the issue in such a manner? Well... <clears throat> The, it's been my experience over the years, and and I think uh, any experienced political activists as well as the uh, NRA and TSRA lobbyists would, would agree that number one, you have to be respectful. Um, 
Again, you cannot insult, intimidate, or frighten someone into supporting your position. I don't care what the issue is. So number one, you have to be respectful. Uh, most of us, me included, someone insults you, your natural reaction is, you know, if this is a jerk, why don't I punch him in the nose? And even if you're not a violent person and you never deliver the blow to their spouse, it's still the natural reaction. So you entrench people against your, your point. So number one, you absolutely positively must be cordial and respectful. Don't threaten to vote against them. Don't threaten to, to find someone to run against them in the primary. I mean, first of all, that's silly. Uh, the groups that are, that are making these claims cannot affect, cannot impact uh elections. So that's not going to happen. So number one, be a statesman, be cordial, be respectful. Number two, and this is the one that, that's kind of tough for a lot of folks to, to swallow because they think that either I or the NRA or the TSRA or even the Texas Firearms Coalition are trying to dictate when people can and, and should not contact their senator or representative. And, and let me say up front, that is not the case. If someone wants to write a letter now or make a phone call and say, hey, uh, I really would like to see House Bill X pass or Senate Bill Y pass. That's okay. What what we don't particularly find helpful is if somebody, for instance, on the Texas CHL forum that you mentioned, if someone makes a call now, hey, everybody on the forum, all 15,000 plus members need to write a letter to their congressman, I'm, well, I'm talking about federal there, to their, to their state senator or state house member and support open carry. That's where it's a mistake because when we, when we issue what we refer to colloquially as calls to action, that's when numbers and timing count the most. So the occasional letter or the, the, I won't say one-off letter, but when, when uncoordinated letters or phone calls are made because a person wants to contact their elected official, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But when we're talking about a large number of phone calls, faxes, or letters, and nobody writes letters anymore, understand that, at least not snail mail letters, that is, it's critically important that those be done only when a call to action has been issued. And when we do that, when a call to action is issued, we want people to get on the phone, get on the fax machines, and yeah, send emails, but even though emails are so easy to send, they're equally easy to ignore. It's a whole lot tougher for staff to ignore a phone call or a fax. And faxes are good because it stacks up you know, a pile of paper. So when those calls to action are issued, it's important that we have, number one, a very large response, that that response is very respectful, and a lot of folks don't usually think about this other element, and that is when we ask you to stop, the calls and letters and faxes and emails need to stop because it is equally important when you're trying to show your 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 reach, your power in terms of voter response, it's important to turn it on, to be able to turn it on and to be able to turn it off because when you have made your impact, and a representative said, okay, I got it, I got it, I'm, we're going to vote for it. Turn it off. My staff has other things to do. It's so important that we're able to turn it off. And the thing about phone calls is that they take time from the staff. So when you're making phone calls, you're definitely getting the attention from them because they're spending that time. And they notice spending that time. They notice the paper piling up because that takes physical space. And, you know, like you said, when, when somebody is... When, when they say, hey, make it stop, and you make it stop, it's kind of like, well, this also can affect when we have a vote, this can also be turned against us. And people realize that. That's exactly right. And, and that's the, why, the two reasons you gave, phone calls and, and, and faxes, or why email is so, so much less effective, has less impact than calls and, and, and letters, because they don't take any time. They can be read or ignored, and I can guarantee you they're like most of us. They're going to be ignored. During the, uh, during the, legis well, during the election cycle and during the legislative session, uh, I get at least 250 to 300 emails that are not spam. It's people wanting to know this or that or suggesting this or that, and I can't, I can't read all those. I certainly can't read all of them in a day and practice law. So a lot of them, by the time I get to them, are probably stale dated or whatever. And you, you can apply, you can multiply that by, you know, <laughs> by thousands for every single one of the folks in Austin. So emails are ignored, but you're right. Phone calls, they have to take time to answer. Experienced 
senators, experienced House members, will require their staff to at least keep a, a tick mark list, pro-con, on various bills and issues. So when that call comes in, they may not spend a lot of time, but they're making that pencil mark on their on their, on their their cheat sheet as to how many calls are coming in in favor or opposed to legislation. And that's huge. And then, again, with the, uh, with the stack of, of faxes, they are typically either divided into two stacks, you know, pro con or they are the uh, source material for yet another tick mark on that cheat sheet that they keep for their boss so it's it's very effective it's very effective it's effective when it comes in masses but again i'm not saying that people shouldn't write a letter now if they want to i'm just saying coordinated efforts to try to get your entire family and your 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 block in your neighborhood to do it or or a group on texas chl forum to do it that's premature numbers count when we're uh, responding to a call to action. Well, uh, I guess the next thing I need to ask you about is where can people get the calls to action from? Well, there's going to be three ways. Um, in the NRA, if you're an NRA member and you're on their, their mailing list, the NRA is going to send out calls to action. You'll see a lot fewer from the NRA because they typically go out on NRA back bills. Now, some folks think that every single pro-gun bill in the Texas legislature is an NRA bill. That's that's not true at all. They may be backed by the NRA. Then again, they may not. It just depends on whether there's some unintended consequences within a bill. But that's that could be another topic we talk about. <laughs> but the second way you can get um, calls to action will be from the TSRA. You'll typically get perhaps a few more from TSRA than you will from NRA because TSRA does um, sponsor, well, sponsor, they do write, at least some lawyer that I know writes it, and uh, TSRA, it's a TSRA back bill that maybe the NRA is not as heavily involved in. So you may get a few more from TSRA, and then certainly you can get them by signing up for um, for the Texas Firearms Coalition at texasfirearmscoalition.com because I send them out there and I put them on the website. And I also uh, put the calls to action on the texasCHLforum.com. So there are a lot of ways that folks can stay informed. And sometimes it's rare that you will, well, you will never see conflicting calls to action, really. I mean, you're not going to see NRA send out a, a call to action saying call and support this bill, and TSRA sends, a, sends one out saying oppose the same bill. I mean, that's just not going to happen. But you may see a uh, call to action coming from, from some organization uh, on a bill that just doesn't come out from another organization. And probably you'll see more of that with uh, the Texas Firearms Coalition. Uh, calls to action than you would um, between TSRA and NRA because TSRA is the state affiliate for the National Rifle Association. All righty. Well, I know uh, on the Texas CHL forum, you you had some high praise for a gentleman I used to vote for uh, by the name of Charles Perry, and I voted for him when he was my state representative. But since he moved to the state senate, uh, he no longer is of he's no longer covering my county, so I can't vote for him anymore. But I would like to thank you for that high praise you gave him on the forum. Well, you know, I I, I believe we need to to let folks know when somebody does something great. Uh, there's a particular gentleman whose name I won't mention uh, on the podcast uh, with whom I've had great differences uh, for quite some time now. But he did something recently that was right, and you know, I thought it only fair for me to say, hey, you know, I. Uh, I call him out when I think things are, are done poorly, and not, it was only fair to uh, give him credit for at least one thing that I think he did right. And, and certainly when it comes to elected officials, I think we have to. I mean, so many people find it easy, and I'm not really busting their chops for it. I mean, it's human nature. We've got to be careful of this not only in the political arena but in our personal lives. It's so easy to ask for things and then forget to say thanks. When exactly. You get it. And and that's what I want to make sure to to the extent I can influence anyone's opinion. I want to try to make sure that we do give credit where it's due. And Charles, like I said, I do appreciate you giving those high uh those high comments to him because he, you know, he's been a great guy and, you know, when he was in the state house and I hope I hope he keeps it up in the state senate. But uh moving on, uh, one thing I know uh, you've wanted to talk about is uh, the election for the House Speaker position in the 84th legislature. Now, that was a historic event, in all honesty, and it could have some major impacts not only on gun rights but on several different issues. Would you mind explaining why that's the case and how gun rights could be affected by it? 
Yeah, it could it could be well, it is huge. Okay. How much impact? Don't know at this point. Obviously, um let's have a let's have a talk six months from now. We'll <laughs> we can speak authoritatively. <laughs> but whether it has a huge impact or not, this was a a monumental event because it is the first time in forty years that we have had a contested speakers race. And by that I mean you actually take a vote. There have been times several times, matter of fact, when the beginning of a session or or within a few weeks or months prior to a session, House members have expressed an interest in running for speaker against a, a then sitting speaker. But those, at least for the last 40 years, have always been resolved by determining informally who's going to vote for you and who's not. And rather than push it to a vote and and suffer the uh, consequences of a number one public loss that nobody likes to lose in public, and two greater retaliation from the uh, speaker that you could not defeat, most people just back out. That's exactly how uh, Joe Strauss came in when the Gang of Eleven, appropriately named in my opinion, uh, the Gang of Eleven joined with all the Democrats in 2009 and selected one of the Gang of, of Eleven. Uh, Representative Joe Strauss to be the next speaker. Well, Tom Craddock, rather than Craddock, rather than than uh, pushing it to a vote, did exactly what all the predecessors had done for years, and that is, he withdrew his name. So there was never a vote, and never a record vote. So when a speaker did or did not do something that a uh, House member's constituents don't like, he could really hide behind the argument. Well, nobody ran against him. I didn't have a chance to vote against someone else. That has changed, and hopefully it will be different every session. Um, even if a speaker gets in that, that you know, is my guy from, from, <laughs> from the get-go. Having competition is good. Number one, it's good for, simply because it, it gives... It gives everyone a choice. Yeah, the the, uh, the legislators are the ones that actually have to vote for it, but it gives we citizens a voice in this as well because we can see how our representative voted. In 2016, when people, voters, you, me, people listening to this podcast, when we listen to candidates, if we're happy, we can look back at their vote and say, you did the right thing. If we're unhappy at what happened in the House, we can look at that list and say, you voted for the guy that bottled up my legislation, either in committee or in the Cowler's committee, or as was done in 2013, a liberal Democrat from El Paso was appointed to the most important committee in the House for gun owners. And that resulted in legislation being bottled up in the committee because he wouldn't allow a vote. For the first time in 40 years, we voters are going to be able to look at the list and say, you can't hide behind the argument that there was not an alternative. There was an alternative, and you chose not to avail yourself of it. And uh, I'll be honest. I think that's going to – I think when the 2016 election comes up, uh, if things don't change with how you know committee members are assigned and all, I think somebody may be held accountable in their local elections as a result of this. I think that's I think that's true. Uh, I don't think that everybody, uh, all seventy seven Republicans who voted for Strauss, are going to are going to lose their primaries. Uh, that's not the case. But I think some weaker links in there will. Uh, and and I also want to say this. I think aside from two thousand sixteen, I think this record vote uh, is going to change how things are done in the House. And I say that because. The Republicans who supported Strauss publicly now, uh, I shouldn't say publicly, officially, they have a strong interest in in prevailing on the Speaker to act like a Republican. Make sure that you don't bottle up bills that that comport with the values that typical Republican voters have, especially those that are expressed in the, the platform of the Republican Party. And I'm not so naive as to think the platform means anything anymore. It doesn't. And therein lies the problem. It doesn't. It's almost as though elected officials, yeah, go have yourself a party, have yourself a convention, come up with your platform, and we'll treat it like a letter to Santa Claus. We may we may give you some of it, we may not. And I think that's I think that's irresponsible. I think it's it's unfair to people who support you. But rather than running down that rabbit trail any further, <clears throat> I think there's a strong interest with all Republican House members to prevail upon the Speaker to make sure that their bills don't die in committees 
or in the calendar committee, or that they don't sit on Senate bills until it's too late to do anything about it. And another tactic is to sit on them in either either committee or, or calendars committee until it's too late, and then you then you, you ship it out and you put it on the general calendar when nothing gets reached on the general calendar. People are, are becoming far more educated about that, largely because you know, there's some certain folks out there that are making sure that they, they <laughs> preach this story and, and get the information out. And I also want to be fair to Joe Strauss. Uh, I, I don't I don't like it when any person or organization either overstates a claim in terms of benefit of the legislation that they want passed, if they overstate the damage it would be caused by a bill that they want defeated, and I certainly don't appreciate overstating or ball faced lying about any elected official, including Speaker Strauss. He has been called largely by the National Association of Gun Rights and Dudley Moore, who's nationally discredited by every major gun organization. But he's been called anti-gun, and that's just not true. It's not true. He has definitely, without doubt, killed some very important gun bills. Campus carries one. Uh, removing off-limits locations for CHL holders is another. I mean, there are other bills that there's no doubt that the Speaker's influence on the committee made sure the vote didn't come up. But by the same token, since 2009, when Joe Strauss first took over the Speaker's gavel, he has supported and helped guide pro-gun bills through the process, and he has helped us pass far more bills than he's killed. Some would argue, me included, that the ones he let go through are not as important as at least some of the bills that he's killed, and there's no doubt about that. So I'm not saying I'm not saying he's he's our guy on the gun issue. What I am saying is labeling him anti-gun is unfair. It's also it's also misleading to the voting public because the term, the phrase anti-gun needs to be reserved for people like Senator Rodney Ellis, for Senator West. I mean, the Lon Burnham, who thankfully even lost his primary. I mean, these folks worked against gun owners at every opportunity. They voted against every pro-gun bill, and they they file anti-gun bills every session. So when you call a guy who's 80% your friend anti-gun, number one, it's unfair to that, that person, and two, it waters down the true meaning of being anti-gun. Uh, Ronald Reagan said it best, and, and frankly, uh, uh, Governor Perry kind of got his percentages off a little bit in his speech yesterday. <laughs> Ronald Reagan once said that a man who votes with me 90% of the time is not a 10% enemy. He's a friend, and that's true. Like it or not, that's true. I met my wife on a school bus when we were 12 years old, and I've been crazy about her ever since. We've been married for almost 42 years, and we don't agree on everything, not by a long shot. That does not make her my enemy. Well, on the same token, I'll I'll come out and say it. I don't agree with the NRA on everything they've done or have done in the past. However, you will find that I am probably one of the one of the last people you will ever see attack the NRA on an issue simply because they are my friend. You know, I will never I mean, agree that, with everybody. That's an excellent example. I probably shouldn't say this. Maybe some of my fellow <laughs> board members may not like it, but uh, it's the truth. I don't agree with everything that we, we the NRA, d- does. Uh, what I do appreciate is the fact that we have our input. We discuss issues, sometimes <laughs> rather emotionally, but, you know, we're arguing among friends. Uh, but at the end of the day, we develop a consensus, we develop a battle plan, and we all march to that battle plan. Because our individual opinions outside of the meeting, once once the decision's made, our individual opinions don't matter anymore. Now we have to provide a, a, a unified front because an army that fights together wins. An army that is scattered does not. And that's true on the battlefield. It's true in the polit- political arena as well. So I agree with you. Uh, there are some things that, that I wish we'd done differently. And in the years that I've been serving uh, as a legislative activist, I've had a number of meetings at, at the local level here with, uh, uh, well, I won't mention specific names, but the lobbyists for NRA and TSRA, where, you know, we have, most, I don't want to give, I don't want to give an inaccurate opinion. Most of the time our meetings are, are very cordial, very uh, collegiate, and and we come up with a consensus. Sometimes emotions can run very high, especially when I'm wanting a bill that filed that I've wanted for several sessions. 
so when people think, oh, it's, it's some kind of conspiracy, and it's every, we're always sitting around, you know, arms around each other singing kumbaya, and, and you know somebody from headquarters tell us what we're supposed to sing, and we'll do it, that's just not true. I mean, we can be as emotional and, and as, and as uh, passionate about a particular issue as anybody else out there. But when we leave those meetings, we present a united front, and we win. And I'm, I'll, be, I'll be the first person to say it, uh, thank you for that. I appreciate that. I mean, <laughs> truth is, I've been called anti-gun and anti-Second Amendment and you name it uh, because because uh, I write bills and that uh, that deal with concealed carry to improve our concealed carry statute. Uh, and the argument or the the false allegation is, I'm happy with the licensing system. I wish there was no requirement for a license. I wish I wish we would get. I hope we do get a U.S. Supreme Court opinion that says there is a constitutional right to carry handguns for self-defense. We're not there. We may never be there. Depends on the makeup of the court and who wins the White House in 2016. I wish we were there, but we're not. I would like to live long enough to see all of Chapter 46 in the Texas Penal Code repealed. I want to see us focus on bad acts, not the tools that are used by some bad actors unlawfully or to harm someone else when those same tools are used by countless millions of Americans, including Texans, for legitimate use every day. We are not there yet. To me, that's legislative utopia. We're not there yet. We may get there, but we're not. And until then, the best I can do for my fellow gun owners is try to improve our laws and therefore expand our gun rights. Well, Charles, before I let you go, let me ask you, are there any recent articles on the Texas Firearms Coalition website that you want to suggest people read or anything else you'd rather you'd like to say to people before we let you go? Well, I, I, I do hope that folks will keep up with the articles on the uh, TexasFirearmsCoalition.com. Um, during the legislative session, I try to write more on there, and uh, I explained my, my personal plans for uh, the future now and, and what I've done with my law practice. So... There should be a lot more going on, not just during the legislative session anymore, but year-round. And there's some other uh, pro-Second Amendment, pro-gun um, activities and, and um, projects that I'm, I am launching or reviving. So uh, hopefully there will be some articles that a lot of folks are going to find interest uh, interesting. I think the, the latest one on there is, is entitled All Eyes Are On Speaker Strauss, and it, that article goes over you know many of the things that uh, we've talked about during during this interview well uh let me just say that you know i'm going to make this available to you bef- uh the whole episode and just the audio from this interview available to you before it's released by me feel free to release it to anyone you want in that time frame uh in the future feel free to use this however you do and or however you wish to use it let me put it that way and Thanks thanks for being here. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, and we can have a little bit of a discussion afterwards. Well, before you, before you do that, let, let me okay. say something real quick. First of all, I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you about, about these issues today, because obviously they're very important. I also want to thank you for what you're doing with the podcast. Uh, I know that the... the, the uh, the name has changed, and uh, I understand why you made, made the change. I think it was a good move because I'd like to see you continue this. But I, I have done a little research uh, in recent months about podcasting and just exactly how popular this is getting and how many people are reached with podcasts because they're available when we're doing other things. It can You can listen to a podcast as you drive to or from work. You can listen to it while you're jogging or working out in the gym, and it's and it's really come into its own in the last couple of years, even though it's been around for 10 years. And I think this is an incredibly important media for the public because it's not controlled by the three major networks, either in their TV or radio broadcast or by the Hearst Corporation in their uh, in their uh, so-called print media. So I want to thank you for what you're doing. I, because of my research, I know how much work goes into what you're doing, <laughs> and I certainly appreciate everything. Well, on that note, uh, anything I can do to help you, feel free to let me know. And, you know, this uh, podcast is available to you at any time. I appreciate it, and thanks for having me. All right. I would like to thank Charles for being on the episode. And with that said, I think it's time to run the contact information by you and then move on to the news. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is 
gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Before I start the new segment, I want to say thank you to Charles Cotton for coming on the podcast. And I really want to thank Charles for everything he does in the state legislature. I know that typically should be at the end of the show when I say I want to thank, but in this case, I'm moving it up a bit. Now, if you want to know more about Charles, you can uh, go to the Texas CHL forum, the Texas Firearms Coalition, and a Google search will turn up a lot of information as well. So feel free to look into Charles. And if you really want to know something about Texas politics, at least in the gun rights movement, Charles is the one to talk to. Now then, let's move on to the news. Most of the news is actually going to touch on issues that Charles and I discussed in the interview, but I do have two stories that are not related to that. First off, in defense of self and others, Lake Jackson, Texas police shot and killed a suspect after he pointed a handgun at them. The suspect was ordered to drop his weapon twice, but did not do so. Three officers on the scene fired their weapons, hitting the suspect in an unreported number of times. Now, neighbors claim the suspect was a lonely, quiet man who was good to his friends. I don't know if the neighbors are just trying to say nice things about the dead and not speak ill of them, or if it's more of a case that this guy somehow had him hoodwinked, or maybe he just snapped, or perhaps he wanted to commit suicide by cop. I don't know. But, you know, the neighbors apparently don't have the full story, or they're not reporting the full story. Well, let's move on from that and go in straight into our politics category. Now, like I said, the politics category is pretty much going to be just about issues that Charles and I discussed in the interview. And to kick things off, a confrontation between open carry advocates and Texas State Representative Poncho Navarez was recorded and posted online as a video by Corey Watkins. Now, for those who listen to the podcast, I'm certain they already know. Corey Watkins is the leader of the open carry, open carry Tarrant County. Ooh, did I ever get my tongue tied there? However, open carry Tarrant County is, uh, they're a political hot potato. They do more harm than good. Now, the activist did refuse to leave the office after being asked repeatedly. Heated words were exchanged, mostly coming from the open carry Tarrant County and other protesters that were involved. And finally, they did eventually move out into the hallway. However, you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a pretty sight. I'm sorry. Now, for those who are listening to the show, you're thinking, yeah, you already talked about that, but I'm going to give you a link to a news article about it. That's why I brought it up in the news segment. Just like our next story, which is the story about the Texas House of Representatives approved rules to allow the installation of panic buttons. Now, this is a direct result of the confrontation mentioned in the earlier article. So that pretty much does that. And basically, I mention it so I can include a link in the show notes under the news segment. Our final news segment relates to the uh, first one. However, Charles Cotton and I briefly discussed Charles Perry in this episode, so it's only fitting that I provide a link to the audio of an interview Charles Perry gave to an area radio station. Now, the area radio station is his is in his hometown, so anybody that's listening to that needs to understand that, yes, I did vote for Charles Perry when he was my state representative, but now that he's in the Senate, he's in a different district, so I can't vote for him anymore. But he's a good guy. He really is. Now, the article of Charles Perry is titled, Senator Charles Perry says, Open carry demonstration hurts the cause. And then in brackets, it's got video. Now, I watched this video late last night, or I should say early this morning. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning. After I watched it, I went to sleep. So, I don't remember exactly what happened, but I think the video is of the news, not newsroom, but the studio where the radio station is broadcast from. So you don't get to see Charles Perry. It's just he's calling in and they're talking to him over the phone. Kind of like I did with Charles on this episode. Well, Charles Cotton. Too many Charles uh, being mentioned in this uh, segment, but oh well. Anyways, Charles Perry gave an interview. He discusses the events and how it hurt open carry. I mean, it ties in very well with what Charles Cotton and I said. And, you know, we did discuss him in the interview, so it's only fitting we include him there too. And our final news story is in the miscellaneous category where the truth about guns did something that allows me to talk about the Charlie Hebdo attacks. Now, a lot of listeners have emailed me saying, why don't you talk about that? Well, up until now, it wasn't a Texas issue, but now it is. The reason it's a Texas issue now is because the Truth About Guns conducted a simulation in Plano, Texas. Now, that simulation has been 
Uh, it didn't go exactly according to plan from what I hear. So when they released the results of their simulation, uh, well, the news media, the gun banners, they were overjoyed. It was like a Christmas gift in the middle of January because that's really what it was to them. Now, I am unsure of the testing methods or how it was set up, but I suspect that the attackers knew they would be facing resistance and they acted accordingly. Additionally, I suspect that they did not reenact the entire scenario from the attackers arriving at the scene through the point where they fled. Essentially, what I'm saying is the scientific method more than likely was not used in this case. Now, my understanding is that the truth about guns did run two different scenarios and they ran them nine times each with people changing out different roles. However, for a truly scientific study on this, the attackers would have to go in thinking, I'm recreating this uh, scenario. They go in, and they don't even know that they're recreating the scenario. They go in thinking, I'm going to simulate an attack. They go in, and then they meet resistance that they were not expecting. That would be a more or less scientific method. That's not entirely scientific, because it would take a lot of work to set that up correctly. And I really doubt the truth about guns did that. In fact, the truth about guns is probably not a source I would like to use in any instance. With that said, I want to wrap the show up. And once again, I'm going to touch back on to those I would like to thank. I would like to thank Charles Cotton for being on the show. I would also like to thank him for everything he's done for Texas gun rights. I want to thank Alice Tripp from the TSRA and Tara Micah from the NRA. And I want to thank all three of them for all the work they do on gun rights and Anything I can do to help them out, all they have to do is let me know. With that said, I'm going to hit the sign-off button, run the music, and end the show. You take care, stay safe, and please carry responsibly.